I'm hoping the audio is working better this time. I regret that the first session for this week had some difficulties. You, of course, if you've watched that, know that it was not the best audio. I'm thinking, let me check this volume level. This is the VU meter I'm looking at. Testing, one, two, three. And I'm hoping that will do it there and it's not blasting, as we say, too much or popping. There were some popping noises that I also heard in the playback before. This is the third lecture for the fourth week, the week of September the 16th. And one more time, I want to ask um, you to forgive me for being late in getting this recorded. We are getting it done, but slowly, and we will have um, to finish all of September and October and try to catch up. We are behind, and that is my fault, but I'll try to do my best. This particular session is entitled Pseudo-Intellectualism and Arrogance Among Graduate Students. That's the lecture title. I, Yes, that's what I call it, graduate students and faculty members. And I want to say, first of all, that some people speak of an university archipelago, or archipelago. An archipelago is a group of islands. And you're familiar with that. You, you live in an archipelago. You live in the Philippines, a group of many islands that are all related to one another under the same jurisdiction, for example. Well, many will speak of the university archipelago. It's though you have each different university as its own island, and yet it's related uh, to a larger community uh, beyond its own four walls, its own campus. And there's sort of a subculture that exists in our society in the United States, and I w would imagine it's the same in other cultures as, where, as well. I each university as it participates in the university archipelago, as it were, becomes its own little universe within itself, kind of a closed system. It has its own unique habits and customs that are really not typical of the world at large. The average person finds it incomprehensible sometimes why instructors and students think as they do and behave as they do and some of the pomp and ceremony and some of the um, the traditions that have that uh, have accrued over the over the centuries in academia are a little bit strange and odd to other people outside of the university archipelago, um, and because of that, I think sometimes we we can grow out of touch with, with the average person when we are part of the university system. When we've gained advanced degrees, we're just not able to communicate with the common man, the average person, and that's unfortunate. Our job is to save souls, and all souls are valuable before God. Knowledge is useful. Knowledge, however, is just a tool. We've heard the old adage, knowledge is power. Yes, knowledge, if it's right knowledge, can be the ability to get things done. What do we want to get done? We want to save souls. We want to glorify God and save fellow men. We want to change our world for the better. Glorify God. Save the souls of individuals. Change our world for the better. How can we accomplish that? One of the tools would be knowledge. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 5, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now those are our marching orders. 2 Corinthians 10 verses 3 to 5. To bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Commentators who have analyzed these verses think Paul may be alluding to the Roman navy which was able to clear the Mediterranean seas of pirates. Piracy had been a big problem on the Mediterranean Ocean for a long time. And it affected commerce. It affected the safety of passengers. So the Roman Navy was strong enough to where it could enforce law out on the high seas and, and could prevent much of the piracy that had been a plague for a long time. Well, one of the ways that they learned to do that was to go into Asia Minor, to modern-day Turkey, to the Anatolian Peninsula. And there find many caves and many mountain strongholds where the pirates lived. These were their bases of operation. And they actually went in and cast down those strongholds 
and destroyed the pirates' fortresses so that they lost their power on land and had no power or very little power on sea. Many think that the words Paul uses in the Greek allude to that sort of thing, that they have that in the background. Casting down imaginations in every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. You can imagine a pirate's fortress in the mountains. He thinks it's impregnable. He thinks it's secure. But the Roman army is capable of taking it down. Well, the soldier of Christ is able to take down these false arguments in high places by the truth by knowledge, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are not physical, not material. They are intellectual. We are engaged in an intellectual struggle. This is why knowledge is so useful, so helpful. But the idea of having knowledge should not be equated with that of superiority. I know of many people who have gone out to learn a great deal about their subjects, to come back to be arrogant and to be spiteful to those who know less than they know to think of themselves as superior it's sort of like a man who goes to the gym and every day he exercises and builds up his body and becomes a great bodybuilder with many strong muscles well he goes out and picks fights with other people and intimidates other people just to show how big a man he is i've known of people who gain information in their schoolwork to come back and do the same thing in the intellectual arena to want to fight and to argue with people just to show how superior they are that's a bad thing some develop a superiority complex a superiority complex listen in God's eyes every human being is valuable that peasant farmer who's way off in the mountains and he's digging in the dirt with sticks and with, he's plowing with with oxen and, and he has no mechanized tools. He's using the old primitive methods just to make enough to feed his family and maybe sell a little bit or barter with his neighbors. Who knows very little bit about the technological gains of our modern world, the advances of our time. That man is just as valuable in the sight of God as the great intellectual thinkers of our age, such as the rocket scientists and the physicists of renown who've made a name for themselves and who were studied about in the school textbooks. He's just as valuable in the sight of God. Human beings are all valuable for being made in God's image. And this is why we should never develop a superiority complex. And yet it happens, especially in the university archipelago. Uh, now, I don't know how this works in your culture, but in mine I have noticed, and I've seen this also in Great Britain, that some who enter into the world of academia and want to be noticed by others as academics, as academic types, we say, who want to wear their academic attainments on their sleeve so that when they go in pu public, people recognize them and say such things as rabbi, rabbi, or at least doctor or master. Uh, those kinds of people uh, sometimes are, are, are out of touch with the common man, and they they don't even dress as we dress. I've seen them, not always the case, but many times parting their hair down the middle, wearing bow ties rather than the long neckties we normally wear in our culture, and adopting a hyphenated last name. Now, in Anglo-Saxon culture, generally, when um, a man is born or a person is born, he takes on his father's last name, or, she, or a woman, a young girl, takes on her father's last name. That's typical in Anglo-Saxon culture. Well... What is atypical or unusual is to adopt a hyphenated last name, the, the father and the mother's last name. Now, that's not so unusual in other cultures. I'm not familiar with your own situation, but I know among Hispanics, they would take the name of the father and the mother as part of their name. Uh, but they adopt the hyphenated last name. Just pretentiousness, being pretentious. There is a danger in learning. As useful as learning and knowledge is, there is a danger in knowledge because the danger is becoming prideful about what we know. Pride is a terribly destructive human tendency. Paul warns about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 1. Now, the New American Standard Bible renders a part of this verse as knowledge makes arrogant. The King James says knowledge puffs up. Knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. Charity edifies or builds up. Now, what Paul is warning about is how you can gain knowledge that your brother does not have, for example. And you can become prideful or puffed up. You can be arrogant because you realize that you know more about a subject matter than your brothers. So you may think of yourself 
as more important than your brothers. And yet, when we love them as we ought, we want to build them up regardless of how little or how much they may know. Paul also warns about pagans who've become pagans because they rejected a knowledge of God in Romans 1 and verse 22 where he says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And then you remember how he goes on in verse 30 to warn they became proud and boasters. And you remember too how he goes on to warn how they perverted God's design for human sexuality and, and developed all kinds of vices and abominations in the sight of God. Working shameful deeds and forgetting about God and choosing to suppress a knowledge of God that should be natural to right-thinking human beings. All of that because they professed themselves to be wise. They thought of themselves as wiser than others. And this was a typical Greek problem. Uh, not all Greeks thought this way, but many of the educated Greeks thought of themselves as superior to the others. We're the Greeks and the rest of the world are the barbarians. They thought of themselves. We are cultured. The rest of the world is inferior. And this is a danger. Now, I notice this tendency, especially among liberals or left-wingers, those out in left field. It's rife with this tendency. Now, it can happen also to conservatives, those on the right side, on, on, in the right wing, uh, theologically speaking. Some are boasters and proud. Paul warns about 2 Timothy 3 and verse 2. I, I started to take a, a, a Bible study help, a, a, a special book, a big thick book, that lists many passages dealing with the theme. And look at the theme of pride. But the warnings are so ample, there wouldn't be enough time in this lecture to do all of that. So I thought, well, you can do that. You student. You go back and you take your concordance, for example, and look up the word pride in the Old Testament. And you'll see the number of warnings that are found in such places as the book of Job. And especially in the book of Proverbs and in Ecclesiastes, all the wisdom literature. It continually deals with the sin of pride and with the problem of pride. Pride of knowledge in particular. Pride of knowledge. This is a big deal today in modern academia. The secularists of our time are having a field day in my country in maintaining their death grip on the throat of religious students who want to believe in God but who are not allowed to say anything about their belief in our classrooms because they who teach the Darwinian theory of evolution claim to know more than anybody else. And they claim to have superior understanding and that nobody else has a right to speak on the matter of human origins, for example, except for them and for them alone. Often they reflect really little familiarity with philosophy or logic or even common sense, but they claim, they boast, they claim to have and they boast about having great or superior knowledge. Well, I'm not going to say much more about that. This is also going to be a short lecture after all. We must guard against pride, the pride of knowledge. James 4 and verse 6 says, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. I think this is what has happened in the case of some of those gospel preachers that I mentioned to you in another lecture who have lost their faith, who have gone to school and obtained advanced degrees, and who have forgotten where they came from, who have forgotten what they used to believe and used to defend as sound doctrine. They become prideful. They want to fit into the world of their peers who do not believe as we believe. They want to be thought of as intellectually superior and at least equal to their peers in academia. And so they're not willing to take stands that are controversial. I hope that doesn't happen to you, my brother, that you're willing to stick with the truth and to maintain and defend the truth regardless of the cost, even if they smile, even if they laugh at you, even if they jeer or mock, that you will tell the truth, telling the truth in love but not being prideful, not considering others to be below you, but considering others even better than yourselves, as the Apostle says. We are to esteem others even as better than ourselves. The more we study, the more there is a danger of using our knowledge to bolster our own pride. Be careful, my brother. Don't allow this setting, this graduate school, to harm you in that way. Well, thank you very much for your attention, and the Lord willing, I'll try to get the other lectures presented very soon.